For more on the global water crisis and how it's impacting the most vulnerable regions, let's bring in environmental scientist Kate Braumann. She's the lead scientist for Global Water Initiative at Institute on the Environment at the University of Minnesota. Kate, thanks very much for joining us. I appreciate it. One it's great to be here. Thank you. I want to begin by uh, not trying to overstate the situation, but when you hear uh, the information, it's alarming. Uh, the New York Times points out 17 nations are facing an extreme water crisis, meaning they're using almost all the water they have. Drought is largely to blame, but so is mismanagement. It's a broad question, but how did we get here? We got here in a lot of different ways. And, you know, what's key is exactly what you said, that this is both about drought and about supply, but it's really also about demand and use. And so sometimes we see situations that look like Somalia does, where there's not a lot of water storage and it really is a supply issue. They don't have a lot of resilience. But in lots of other situations, we can actually manage these problems really well by managing the demand side and doing more with less water. You know, in, in many ways, how we got here is the easy part of the question, fixing it, something entirely different. Last year in Cape Town, South Africa, it was on the fringe of day zero. Firstly, explain what day zero is and what is the water situation like now in that area? So in Cape Town, like in lots of places, they depend on reservoirs for their water supply. And it's for the city and also for the agricultural areas around Cape Town. And after three years of drought, those reservoirs were getting really, really low. And the city and also the, the um, provincial and national governments had been trying to manage this problem. Um, for three years, actually, and it was really only as they got into the third year of drought that the levels of water got so low that they realized it was going to get lower than their water intakes, and they just weren't going to have enough water to do anything except provide really point access to large numbers of people in the city. Um, they actually didn't end up getting there, and the way that that happened was really through this demand-side management. Once Cape Town started talking about day zero, people started to take this really seriously and they started using less water. They also did a couple of technical fixes and they um, ended up having the agricultural sector do much better water management. So they got through the dry season and then when the rains came again, um, they were no longer in a drought situation. And so while those reservoirs have been filling up, um, they really have been working on long-term supply management in order to move forward and not be in such a risky position. Okay, picking up on a few of those items. Uh, some nations such as India, they're growing crops that, that just suck up a great deal of water, and that's a major concern. Day zero roughly means the day there isn't water for people when they turn on the tap. What have we learned specifically, you touched upon it, but in other regions around the world. How can we work on that management going forward so we avert a crisis, at least for the time being? There are lots of different solutions. And, you know, they range from everything like fixing pipes in cities <laughs> so that you don't have leaking underground. But in the best cases, we also find ways to make use of water when we have it and not when we don't. So actually, when we have agriculture and people sharing the same water, but there's flexibility in the agriculture. So you could decide to, for example, fallow your fields for a season and use that water for the city if there was a drought. That makes us a lot more resilient and gives us a lot more flexibility for management. Again, in simple terms, fallow field, just rotate crops. Don't use that field for the... Rotating crops, maybe even not irrigating or not growing crops one year. Interesting. I want to talk about uh, climate change. And clearly, that is playing a huge role in all of this. I was in Tibet recently and learned that that area, really so many rivers feed such a large area of, of Asia. And there's massive concern about the glaciers melting in that region. Definitely. It's a huge issue because the great thing about glacial melt is that it evens out your water supply and it tends to come during the warm season. So you get water when you need it the most. And as those glaciers recede, for a little while, right now, we're getting more water than we used to. But as the temperatures rise, those glaciers are actually getting smaller, and that source of water is disappearing. And so it's going to have a major negative impact um, all throughout that part of the world. You know, we also touched upon Flint, Michigan, and that story has been chronicled time and time again. But let's talk about clean water. It is a serious issue in many developing nations, and obviously here in the United States as well. What are governments doing, and what can they do? 
biggest thing that governments have done and need to keep doing is actually really supporting paying for infrastructure and keeping infrastructure in good shape. We are all happier when we turn on the tap and there's water available and it's clean. And so a lot of the pipes that we put in, we put in 50 or 100 years ago. And infrastructure doesn't last forever. We need to start replacing it. And that's just going to cost money. And that's in areas that are developed. And in undeveloped areas, it's even worse. Kate, I want to thank you very much. Absolutely. This issue is not going away. I'm sure we'll have you back to chat more about this in the future. Kate Bauman, thank you very much. Thank you very much.